Um, I'm Kathleen Miklas. I'm with the Friends of the Simsbury Public Library. And on their behalf, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. We are very excited to have Alyssa Altman here to speak. Such an honor. Um, about her new book. Now, give me a second, because I'm the token shiksa in the room. Um, no, no, you're not. <laughs> I've been, I've been, <laughs> oh, I'm not? That's what they used to call me in publishing. Um, Trafe. My Life as an Unorthodox Outlaw. Um, it's her newest memoir. Um, Alyssa is the critically acclaimed, award-winning author of Poor Man's Feast, a love story of comfort, desire, and the art of simple cooking. The James, it is the James Beard award-winning blog of the same name. Um, she's also the author of the Washington Post column, Feeding My Mother, and she's been a finalist for the Frank McCourt memoir um, prize. She's a contributor to publications ra ranging from the Tin House and Dame Magazine to O, the Oprah Magazine, Savour, Savour, and the New York Times. Um, I just want to quote a review for Trafe from Kirkus Reviews, which is a really tough review source. They do not give out easy reviews. Quote, in this richly textured narrative, Altman not only reveals how she learned to interweave the contradictory threads of her life in a complex whole, she gives, an, she gives eloquent voice to the universal human desire to belong, a poignant and life-affirming family memoir. <clears throat> Alyssa is a 2016 resident fellow at the Vermont Studio Center. She writes full-time from her home in Newton, Connecticut, where she lives with her spouse of 16 years, book designer Susan Turner. Please help me welcome Alyssa Altman. Thank you so much. If I start going like this, it's not because I have a twitch. It's just this is where the, that's where the, um, the, the, mic, the mic is. Um, thank you all so much for coming out um, tonight. Um, Thank you, friends of the library, and uh, Kathleen, and um, I love Simsbury. I, I have family in Simsbury, and they're here tonight, so that, that's, that's wonderful. Um, and I'm, I'm also, as a, as a um, longtime publishing person in my, in my former life in New York, um, uh, libraries, you know, I always, I always say libraries do, you know, do God's work. I mean, the, the library, support your library. Your library is the, the mo it's the center of your town. It's the center of the, 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 the culture of the town. So it's wonderful for me to see such an active um, and busy library like, like Simsbury. So I'm thrilled that, um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm honored that you asked me uh, to speak to you tonight, and um, keep coming, keep coming back. And um, you know, buying books is great, but you know, supporting supporting libraries is is just as important. So um, before I before I start, um, I have one question that I that I start all of my talks with. How many of you know what the word trafe means? Show of hands. Okay, that's good. That's a that's a pretty good that's a pretty good number. So for those of you who don't, the, so th those of you who don't know what traif means, traif refers to the, um, the the rules of the dietary rules of um, as set forth in Jewish dietary rules as set forth in Leviticus, in um, in the Talmud. It is in the Old Testament. Um, you can read it in any Bible, um, and in English, in Hebrew, and what it basically means is that um, there are certain restrictions that that um, that are that are set down. So we don't eat pork, we don't eat shrimp, shellfish, bottom feeders, uh, fish without scales. We don't mix meat with dairy, and. Um, it would take me a very long time to explain to you chapter and verse why that is. Um, but these rules are, um, you know, roughly 5,700 years old in the neighborhood. Um, of, uh, and, and the other side of it, so, it's, so there, is the, there is the Talmudic 
um, religious meaning behind it. The other side of it is the more um, the more sort of colloquial um, meaning, which is unclean, dirty, different, unacceptable, on the outside looking in, something that doesn't quite fit in. When I was a kid growing up in Forest Hills, New York in the 1960s and 70s, um, I, you know, I had friends come into my house, I was in their house, and, and I had one friend in particular who would come to visit and she would sometimes stay for dinner and my grandmother, my mother's mother, who is called Gaga in this book, would look at her and look her up and down and say, oh, trafe. <laughs> you know. um, and th so that was another way, and that was really the first time I ever heard the word used in that, in that sort of um, pejorative way, colloquial pejorative way. Um, of course, you know, I grew up in, um, in 1960s and 70s Forest Hills, New York, at a time when the world was changing tremendously. There was tremendous cultural change and cultural shift going on everywhere. Um, you know, there were people marching in the streets for all manner, all manner of things. Um, and anybody who, um, w whose family came to the United States from somewhere else, it didn't have to be the old country, it didn't have to be Eastern Europe, but somewhere else, experienced um, a certain amount of um, assimilation and all that that means. Um, I had uh, friends whose families came from Ireland um, in the 30s and 40s. I had friends whose uh, family came from, um, from Italy. They went through the same thing. Um, there was a profound desire to, to want to belong. I mean, that's what we all want, right? We don't want to always be on the outside looking in. We want to belong to the, to the cultures that, uh, that, that open their, their doors to us. Um, and, and certainly this, this was something that, um, that happened even more after the Second World War. Um, and my backstory, to give you a little bit of, um, of, of my own story, um, my father's parents were born in the old country, um, Eastern Europe. My father's father was born in a tiny town in the Ukraine. Um, my father's mother was born in um, Chernovitz, uh, which was um, part of Romania. Um, and in 1905, at the age of 11, my grandfather, who was a Talmudic scholar, um, in his tiny town, ran away from home. And there were a whole, there was a wide a variety of reasons why he ran away from home, but he ran away from home. Um, he was 11 years old when he made the journey here. And there was nobody here on the other side to greet him. And he came here to hear him say it, I, can't, I came with a nickel in my pocket, <laughs> you know. Um, he came with nothing. And he was a boy. I mean, if you, you know, you, when I think of it now, when I look at 11-year-old kids and I, th and I put my grandfather's face on, that, on a child, how is that possible? And everywhere I've spoken, you know, people have said to me, oh, my grandfather did the same thing. And, in, you know, at this time, only he was Irish or my, grand my grandfather came from Italy or Poland and, you know, or Germany and they did the same thing. So this is, a universal, this is a universal story. There was a period of time between the 1880s and, uh, you know, and, and into the uh, 20s and 30s where there was an enormous migration of, um, of Europeans um, into to the United States. And my grandfather, as a child, was one of them. Um, when he got here, uh, he eventually became a, um, an, an orthodox uh, cantor in, on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, he was very involved in Yiddish theater. He knew Molly Pecan and Zero Mostel and all of you know, those names are, are, uh, are 
recognize, recognizable. Um, and through his whole life, what he, what he, he rarely talked about it um, unless pressed, but all of the people, most of the people he left behind in his tiny town were murdered during the Holocaust. He lost his mother, he lost siblings, he lost cousins. Very few people, um, very few people uh, from his town left. Um, his whole life was a struggle uh, between the past and the present, the modern and the traditional, and the, 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 the push-pull between how much do I bring with me, how much do I, how much practice do I bring with me, how, how much of my religion, my religion, I mean he was not Hasidic in his town, but he was very, very religious. Um, he married my grandmother in 1917. Um, she was, she came here at two years old. She has no, she had no uh, memory whatsoever of, of, of the old country. But the push-pull went on constantly. So the, the issues of assimilation and um, wanting to fit in, um, wanting to be part of the, the country that accepted him and welcomed him um, was something that he lived with all the time. And it, it, so it was not something that just happened to us in the, in the 60s and 70s. It, it traveled through my family line. Um, conversely, my mother's parents were born and raised here. My grandmother, who was Gaga in this book, um, was born and raised in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, so she was like an original hipster. And <laughs> my grandfather, Philip, um, was born and raised in Williamsburg, Brooklyn in 1893. So he was an even more original hipster. And they were Americans through and through. Until the day she died, my grandmother had the flag in her kitchen. She had a picture, of, a, a famous um, photograph of, of Roosevelt in the kitchen. And she would not allow Yiddish to be spoken in the house. Um, she was as American as American could be. And that was what she wanted her daughter, my mother, to be. And that was what she wanted me to be. Um, but every once in a while, at the dinner table, when she didn't want me to know what was going on. <laughs> you all know where this is going, right? You know, she would, she and my father, my father's first language was Yiddish, um, would speak, would speak y Yiddish to each other. And, you know, they, and that stopped when I was 12 years old when they finally figured out that I knew what they were saying after that much exposure. But my, my dad, um, you know, was obviously was born here. Um, he was one of um, five Jewish night fighter pilots across all branches of service. He flew off the, um, the USS Enterprise in the Pacific, um, and it was a point of great pride um, for him. But as an officer, um, he was an officer at 19. He had his wings at 19. He was still considered in his branch of, in the Navy, um, in his beautiful officer's whites, he was still considered a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn. And so he struggled his whole life in the way my grandfather struggled to, to, to try and assimilate. He assimilated as best he could um, and it was a source of great personal conflict for him because he was culturally connected to his past. Um, and this is something, again, that, that this is a theme that plays itself out over and over and over again in, in, in my life, in my past, with the people who came before me, and certainly in my, in my own life. And the question that kept coming up when I, when I started writing this was, how much do we carry forward from our past? from who we are. What do we leave behind? What is, a, what is okay to leave behind? And who are we? Um, this is something I, I think we all ask ourselves this, qu this question. Um, 
and, and I think anybody who says they don't ask themselves that question isn't really, isn't really, um, isn't really telling, telling the truth, isn't really being honest. So Trafe is a story of assimilation and paradox and, um, and contradiction, you know. Um, and in the beginning of the book, I tell a story about being uh, at my best friend, my best grade school friend's bat mitzvah in Forest Hills, New York. And her parents were quite a bit more uh, religious than mine were. Mine were not religious at all. I did not grow up in an observant home at all. But my friend, Candy Feinblatt, I mean, you've got to love that name. <laughs> Candy Feinblatt was extremely religious. And so when she turned 12 years old, we, you know, when we celebrated her 12th birthday and we went to her bat mitzvah. And after the bat mitzvah, we all crossed Queens Boulevard and went to the Tung Shing house for Chinese food. <laughs> and of course, what's in Chinese food? But you know, my fa I said to my father, what's the red tipped meat floating in the wonton soup? And he said, you don't need to know, just don't ask. So that contradiction was always there. That push pull was always there. And you know, somebody asked me not, not long ago, you know, why did you write this book? Why did you, and, and I, I wrote it because I wanted to understand the concept of paradox and contradiction in the, in the way it, it applied to my family. Who are we? None of us. Um, I'm, I have an aunt who's 98 and lives in Florida, and this is something that she still deals with on a, on a, on a regular basis. Who, who are we? What are we? Um, is it okay to do one thing but not another. Um, and, and I've learned over the course of, of writing this book that um, ambiguity is okay. And we live ambiguous lives. Um, I'll never know the answer uh, to who I am. Um, and I've come to learn that that's, that that's okay. That, that, that that's okay. That's the human condition. None of us has the answer. Uh, you, you know, um, uh, Odysseus searched and searched and searched to look for home and look for truth, and, and he never found it. And, and it was the search, it's a, you know that, that old, it's on t-shirts everywhere, it's the, it's the search, it's not the destination. And, um, and I, that's really what, 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 Trafe, is, what Trafe is about. Um, I'm going to read a couple of sections tonight, if that's all right with you. Um, I'm going to start with a short section. Um, we all, um, when we get to a bless you, when we get to a certain point in our lives, we begin to inherit things from from the past, and we can inherit religion, we can inherit practice, we can inherit height and hair color, and we can also inherit the things of, of the people who went before us that we take and we hold and we keep in our hearts and in our homes uh, because they belong to those people who went before us and they, they, they're, they're meaningful. Um, when my grandmother died, my father's mother died at 93 years old in the early 1990s, and um, my aunt, her daughter, inherited um, a piece of furniture from her um, it lived with my aunt for a number of years. Then it got passed down to my cousin. My cousin lived with it for a number of years. Then it went to another cousin. And then finally it went to me. And what I discovered in, once it landed in my house was that not one person liked it. <laughs> Everybody hated this piece of furniture. And where is it living now? In my kitchen. And I'm, 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 I'm getting there. <laughs> a pile of ancient, and I'm talking in this section, I'm talking about the kitchen in the home that I share with my partner. A pile of ancient cast iron Griswold pans inherited from Susan's Aunt Ethel is stacked up on the shelf under the island. 
an old cream colored glass front cupboard that I bought years ago from a Westport consignment shop leans against one wall packed with two dozen ironstone platters crazed with, with time. A smaller walnut cupboard, which sat in my paternal grandmother's Coney Island kitchen for almost 70 years and for decades gave off small clouds of chicken fat every time its doors were opened, <laughs> is filled with hundreds of spice containers. After my grandmother died in, 19, in the early 1990s, her daughter, my aunt Sylvia, took possession of the fragrant cabinet. She had it refinished in a mossy army green, the color of the dangerous forest in a Grimm's fairy tale, and used it to hold the delicate flowered porcelain tea service that her own grandmother carried over from Romania in 1893. Eventually, Sylvia tired of the cupboard and passed it along to her daughter, Lois, who refinished it again, stood it in a darkened corner of her Long Island home near her powder room, and used it to store 25 Passover Haggadahs and her physician husband's collection of vintage white china invalid feeders. <laughs> After a few years, Lois didn't want it either, but needing to keep it in the family, she passed it along to me. There was no question that I'd take it. Of course I would even though I didn't much like it any more than anyone else did. It was like a particularly hideous piece of heirloom jewelry that everyone fawned over when it hung from the neck of its owner, but secretly loathed. Nobody wanted the cupboard, but nobody would dare turn it down either, or break the family chain, as if saying no was tantamount to rejection of our bloodline and our history. It's lived for, for years in my kitchen, longer than at Lois's house and longer than at Aunt Sylvia's. I've made it mine. It's unrecognizable now with new poles and its Napoleonic finial unscrewed, removed, and long discarded. It's filled now with the stuff of comfort, glass canisters holding everything from Lebanese zatar to hot pimenton and dried heirloom chimayo chilies and brown mustard seed from India. On top of it is perched a copper stockpot from Deloran in Paris and a black clay soup tureen from Colombia. My grandmother's cupboard, which was passed from home to home out of duty, has landed here where it is cherished. I can do nothing but smile every time I look at it. What had long been an albatross of obligation, the cupboard has become a kitchen witness, a repository of nourishment and life. So, you know, when you talk about paradox and contradiction, there's a certain, you know, there's a certain irony that goes along with it. Um, I grew up with this, with, this, with this cabinet. I spent every Sunday of my childhood schlepping out to Coney Island with my parents to sit in my grandmother's kitchen and to be fed weird foods that I had no idea what they were. And there was this cabinet that sat, that sat in the corner and the last thing certainly I ever would have thought of at five years old was when I'm in my 50s and I'm living in Connecticut, I'm going to have that thing. Of course, it is still possibly the most hideous piece of furniture I've ever seen. And when my partner um, saw it for the first time, she looked up at it and said, bring me a screwdriver. And she was not talking about a cocktail. Um, <laughs> So I brought her the screwdriver and it had, you know, one of those finial-like things, like the Lord Nelson, if you turned it, it looked like Lord Nelson's hat. Um, she unscrewed it instantly. Um, but it, it has a different meaning for me now. And, um, um, you know, whenever we talk about what's next for us, you know, will we move to Maine? Will we go here? Will we go there? What will we take um, from the big pieces of furniture in our house? I, it has to come with me. It's part of who I am, you know. Did I ever think that would be the case? No. Um, in my family, and in many families, um, th there's also the, the, um, the possibility that one might inherit a home, an apartment. Um, my and that's, again, another form of inheritance and, um, and, and sanctified inheritance because, 
when people came to this country and they found an apartment and they dropped their bags and they moved in, they stayed in that apartment. The world could come to an end, they were not going to leave that, that apartment. In the early 1930s, my grandparents um, were the first residents in an, an apartment building called 602, 602 Avenue T. Um, on Ocean Parkway, Do you, if any of you know Brooklyn, Ocean Parkway, about three subway stops from, the, from Coney Island. And um, I grew up, my father was, was raised there, my aunt was raised there. I grew up every Sunday of my life uh, as a child going there for um, all manner of strange food, strange unrecognizable food. And when my grandfather died in 1976, my grandmother still lived in the apartment, my grandmother died in the early 1990s, and what did my father and my aunt do? They decided to keep the apartment. It was a rental. Nobody was living in it, but it was a rental, and it was um, a whopping $142 a month. So between the two of them, they paid for it, and um, they kept it, and just in case. Um, why? You know, again, it was, it was empty, but it, it, it had all of my grandparents' stuff in it. It had the cabinet, it had, it had history, it had life, it had lives in it. Um, again, what I did not know was that eventually, like the walnut cabinet, that apartment would be mine also. And this is, this is the story this is the story of 602 Avenue T. Family lore. My father was nine when a neighbor living across the street on the south side of Ocean Parkway offered Grandpa Henry first crack at the red brick 1920s Spanish style house he was putting up for sale because he was moving to California. Clay mission roofed and pristinely landscaped with abundant white climbing roses scaling a thick cedar trellis covering the carport and mature rhododendrons with deep fuchsia blossoms flanking the transom, the house took up nearly a quarter of the square city block. The L train rumbled by only a few streets away, but the house was lush and alive and throbbing with the promise of suburbia, and it stood out among the parkway's squat brick buildings as though it had fallen abruptly from the sky. My grandfather, the story went, yearned for that house and all that it meant. He envisioned his children and grandchildren running safely around the fenced-in yard, shielded from the grime and din of Brooklyn. He imagined Talmud study sessions with the local rabbis over his wife's gorgeous kosher dinners prepared in a modern kitchen big enough for two stoves and two sinks and two ice boxes. But it was 1934, the effects of the depression lingered on like a vague hallway odor, and the $25,000 price that Jay Silverheels asked was simply too steep. So my grandfather chose to stay in the two-bedroom apartment with the rippling faux stucco walls that he shared with Grandma Bertha, my father, and Aunt Sylvia. The house across the street became a tantalizing dream and a symbol of what could have been, like the model homes my father would take my mother and me to visit every weekend when I was a child. In what was my grandfather's first brush with Hollywood royalty, they turned down the man who played Tonto and remained at 602 for the rest of their lives. Besides walk to worship, the apartment's allure was dubious. It wasn't the view, although the east-facing bedrooms where my grandfather prayed morning and night were cooled by soft eastern breezes blowing in off Coney Island, and on a clear day you could see the parachute drop and the merchant tankers floating along on the glimmering bay in the distance. My grandmother's prized knobby baby grand piano stood in the dark living room adjacent to the south window and flush against a steam radiator that howled and clanged in the winter and stayed hot and damp regardless of the season. Eventually, the piano's mahogany veneer finish peeled and fissured and its ivory keys crazed like fine porcelain. By the time I moved to 602 Avenue T in 1991, the poster board render rendering of Bruegel's The Harvesters that hung above the sofa bulged out of its frame, making the field hands look like ghosts on a Matthew Brady battlefield. My, fa my family called the apartment 602, 
just 602, like a three-digit secret code for our past. After my grandmother died in her sleep there at 93, my father and Aunt Sylvia left everything in place where it had, where it had stood for almost 60 years. The apartment became a shrine. When I got there, it was like cracking open a time capsule. Assorted bric-a-brac and small china statues from Aunt Sylvia's frequent trips to Europe and South America remained where I remembered them standing nearly three decades earlier on the end tables flanking the couch. My grandfather's vast, dust-caked, leather-bound Yiddish library stood untouched in the mahogany living room break front, bookended by two mother-of-pearl life-size magpies in flight. Photos of my father and Uncle Lee in their World War II uniforms were displayed on the piano, alongside a high school graduation picture of a stunning aunt, teenage Aunt Sylvia shot in the late 1930s, and two 8x10s of my cousins taken when they were in college in the 60s. As a child, I had never noticed it. As an adult, it made me wince. At 6.02, there was no discernible sign of my presence in my grandparents' lives. Nothing about the apartment had changed. Not the original nameplate from 1933, H. Altman had said in swirling Art Deco font of the time, slipped into the little slot under the front door peephole. The phone was still connected with the apartment's original number, S6511177, in the assumption or maybe just the hope that someone might still try to call. On the bitterly cold January day when the apartment became mine, I tried to unpack my suitcases, but I couldn't. My grandparents' clothes, Paisley Keon addresses, a gold polyester bed jacket from a 1970s hospital visit to remove an angry appendix, a white stole of, stole of unidentifiable fur, hung in the closets as though my grandparents still lived there. Both beds were tidily made. My grandfather's massive horsehair mattress in the big east-facing bedroom and my grandmother's narrow single bed in what had been my father and Aunt Sylvia's childhood bedroom. In the bathroom, a matted thicket of frosted hair cocooned my grandmother's favorite Mason Pearson hairbrush, which sat in the medicine cabinet above the flesh-toned sink next to a rusting container of Colgate tooth powder. Her flowered makeup bag gaped open on a small putty-colored stool near the tub, holding the things that made her beautiful. Cody blush in frosted peach, a crumbling cake of dusty brown mascara like a square of old chocolate a pot of Revlon powder blue eyeshadow. When my grandmother died 15 years after her husband, life at 602 had simply been placed on hold like a staticky phone call. Each of us has an immediate olfactory connection to our grandparents who emit the musty clouds of age. Hallways and bedrooms smell like dust or mothballs or liniment. In my case, they smelled like food, and my connection to them grew during the weekend mornings of my childhood when my parents and I walked into the lobby at 602, which reeked perpetually of chicken fat. For years, the building's resident super was a Hasidic rabbi named Lipschitz, who regularly took long, ambling afternoon walks down Ocean Parkway with his young wife and their eight daughters in tow. Lipschitz, who my grandfather detested, Lipschitz the Ghanif, he called him. <laughs> Ghanif means thief. He was still there when I, the building's last tenant, whose legal right to rent the apartment fell under the archaic rules of New York City real estate law, moved in. When we passed each other in the lobby, Lipschitz glared at me from head to toe like Traif. Unkosher, unacceptable, unclean, since I didn't have to gain his approval before taking up residence. Everyone else in the building was ultra-Orthodox and had been since the building was built. That many people cooking that much gribbonas under one roof for more than 60 years had taken its toll. Although Lipschitz took pride in the sparkling cleanliness of the hallways in the lobby, over time the essence of schmaltz had been sucked into the pores of the place. When I moved in, the building still reeked. I feared for my clothes. I was certain that my two cats would stink like a pair of fat Shabbos pullets. <laughs> Can't anything be done about the smell? I asked Lipschitz when I handed over my first check for the $142 a month rent. 
He took it from me gingerly like I was a leper. Maybe you could get out, he said, shrugging. <laughs> Nobody wants you here anyway. I looked at him in silent rage, this man from the old country, the specter from the past. He wanted me gone, banished from his building like it was his own personal shtetl. But I didn't want me there either. It had been a last resort. Cheap rent, a few blocks from the subway, a place for me to get my bearings after a bad breakup. We own it in perpetuity, my father promised me, when I began to receive regular notices of eviction from the building owner who wanted to turn it into a co-op like the rest of the apartments at 602. 5H was the last rental holdout. We don't own it, Dad. I'm paying monthly rent. You'll stay and you'll bring your husband and raise your children there, my father explained matter-of-factly while we were in the car driving to housing court in downtown Brooklyn. He was counting on it, although Lipschitz was evicting me to free up the apartment for sale. Are you del delusional, I said. I have to return to my life in the city. I'm never going to live here permanently. He pulled over into a bus stop and glared at me. There has been an Altman here since 1933, he said, his face beginning to flush a deep red. You are the last one. This is our family home, our connection to the past, to who we once were. It is your responsibility to maintain that connection. The first night I stayed alone at the apartment, my father's phone call set off the ringer amplifiers that he'd left attached to the ceiling in every room. My grandmother had gone stone deaf in her later years. And when he checked in on me, the walls and windows shook and my cats shrieked and hid in the bowels of the coat closet. He was calling, he said, to give me some advice. Whatever you do, he said, don't turn on the stove. <laughs> what if I want to cook, I said. I stood in the foyer in front of my grandmother's Sony Trinitron, sucking down a glass of the Bombay Sapphire Gin that he had deposited on the kitchen shelf next to a rusting 1947 Sedeca box, raising money for the new state of Israel after dropping me off. Use the top burners, but never more than two at a time. And don't light the oven. I'll take you to Macy's tomorrow to buy a microwave. I was suddenly single, alone after a bad breakup, living in my long dead grandparents' apartment with all of their things, their clothes, their pictures, their hairbrushes, their lipstick, and I couldn't even roast myself a chicken without blowing the place up. I couldn't bake a pie or a loaf of bread. I couldn't broil a piece of salmon or make a lasagna or a brisket or oven braised root vegetables. I couldn't even bake a potato. We went to Macy's the next night and my father bought me a microwave big enough to be an end table. <laughs> There's a roast chicken setting, he said, pointing to its front panel. We took it back to 602, plugged it in, heated up a mug of water, and instantly blew one of the two fuses that powered the entire apartment. Lights flickered, a popping sound and a faint whiff of electrical smoke filled the air and we stood in the kitchen in our winter coats and stared at each other in silence, not knowing what to do, like two children. We should go out, he said. <laughs> we went to a nearby Chinese restaurant. We ate at a small table near the bar and got drunk on Gin Gibson's. So where do I buy food, I asked him over a platter of pork fried rice. There's King's Highway, he said, shoveling shrimp and lobster sauce onto his plate. Is there anything closer? Avenue U near the F train. Your grandmother never went there. Why not? Italian. <laughs> Grandma Bertha once stole a piece of bacon from my breakfast plate when my father brought her up to Boston to visit me at college. She ate steamed lobster at the Jolly Fisherman on Long Island and ate prawn cocktails and ham and Swiss sandwiches, Swiss cheese sandwiches and cheeseburgers. But 602 was off limits to anything that hadn't been prayed over, sanctified and koshered, as if the very roof over their heads was tenuous and hanging by a slender fraying thread directly connected to God. Avenue U was a four block walk from 602. There were no taxis or buses involved in getting there. But during my first week in the apartment, it didn't matter because I didn't cook. 
After work on a Friday night, I came back to the apartment starving for pizza and ordered a pie from a nearby pizzeria. Lipschitz gasped when the delivery guy passed him in the hallway carrying the grease-stained white cardboard box with the word sausage stamped on its side. <laughs> I ordered cartons of Szechuan pork from a local Chinese takeout place and ate them at my grandparents' flowered oilcloth covered kitchen table with the parachute drop hovering behind me out the window. I dumped the clumps of cheap double fried meat onto a mountain of steamed white rice I'd spooned onto my grandmother's china and shared the dinner table with the smudged black and white pictures of the marching Israeli children that wrapped around her tzedekah box which stood dusty and forgotten on a corner cupboard shelf since she began stuffing it with folded up dollar bills after the war was over. A week after moving in, I got sick with the kind of flu that makes you want to die. The kind where every joint aches and your fever spikes and every orifice is clogged and stuffed like a drain and any sense of smell or taste is flattened and it no longer matters what you eat because it might as well be a couch cushion. When the moving van left, I had dragged my suitcase into my grandfather's bedroom for the east facing windows and the breezes that I would get in the spring and summer. When the flu hit, I retreated to the massive bed and stayed there for days until a dull ache in my stomach reminded me that I had to eat. Feverish and achy, I pulled on a sweatshirt and jeans and stumbled out across Ocean Parkway towards Avenue U. I found myself navigating a wall of marching, tight-lipped, unsmiling older women pulling empty grocery carts behind them. I followed them south under the elevated F train to the Italian neighborhood where my grandmother never went. There was a cheese shop and a tiny greengrocer selling baskets of fresh fava beans and bunches of spicy bitter punterelli. There was a pork and sausage store that also sold fresh and dried pasta and massive round cans of salted Sicilian anchovies. A bakery selling fresh semolina bread dotted with sesame seeds. A fishmonger, a butcher whose window di display included ducks with their heads on, chicken with their feet attached, and rabbits that had been skinned down to the circles of fur around their feet like the booties on Phyllis Diller. The women with their push carts methodically pop popped in and out of the stores. They ordered loudly, paid for their groceries, and moved on. Horse, I asked the cheese man for Taleggio, my favorite soft, creamy northern Italian washed rind cheese that emits such a stink that it could peel wallpaper. He shook his head no. An older gray-haired lady wearing a jet black cardigan, jet black wool skirt, and suntan pantyhose eyed me up and down with a grimace like I had just flown in from Mars. Don't go anywhere, the cheese man ordered. Just wait a minute. He disappeared into the back of the store and came and a few minutes later returned with a demi tasse cup, which he passed to me over a massive wheel of provolone sitting on the counter. Drink it all at once. You'll feel better. Come back tomorrow. I close at six. A scrim had been lifted, and the CPU world I was living in was suddenly brilliant with color. Every day I did my shopping on Avenue U, and every day the little old Italian ladies in black grilled me about what I was making and how I was making it. Sometimes they nodded in approval and asked me where I lived and whether I was single because they had a nice grandson. <laughs> Often they corrected me. When I said I couldn't bake anything because the oven might explode, they shook fingers in my face and said, you don't need an oven. At the pork store and the greengrocer, I bought anything I could cook on top of the stove. There were thick coils of fennel and garlic sausage that I simmered with red wine, grapes, and thyme, and then seared in a hot skillet. Fava beans that I boiled and shelled and mashed into a topping for the semolina bread that I toasted in my grandmother's oil-slicked cast iron frying pan and then rubbed with garlic. I wilted the bitter punterelli in a pot of salted boiling water and tossed it with orecchiette cooked in the vegetable water and folded giant spoonfuls of thick fatty sheep's milk ricotta into the warm pasta. In the coming 18 months, I left my own cookware packed in boxes in the living room and raided my grandmother's dusty cupboards. Her ancient aluminum pots clattered on the stovetop, their bottoms rounded and dimpled with age. I crushed garlic with my great-grandmother's hawk messer, which I could barely lift. I steamed what needed steaming in a white enameled colander set over a small pot of boiling water. 
I wine-braised butterflied pigeon in my grandmother's old Teflon matzo brai pan covered with a warped cookie sheet. I dredged bronzino and seasoned egg and flour and slid it into a hot butter-coated oval metal casserole from the 1930s that had baked decades of kugels. I drank cheap red wine out of the tiny four-ounce milk glasses of my childhood Sunday lunches. I drizzled warm quartered figs with the dregs of my grandfather's schlibovitz that I found sitting in the depths of the hall closet, buried behind torn clines of 14th Street shopping bags, bursting with the fading letters that my father had written to his parents from the Pacific during World War II when he was 19. I cooked for myself every night and had my dinners alone at the kitchen table, surrounded by the ghosts of the people who had fed me brains and borscht and who said you'll eat it even as my young throat tightened and the food of the past made me weak. Every night for 18 months, I ate my dinner while sifting through piles of dog-eared photographs of long forgotten cousins in Europe, of my acne pock teenage father who longed for his own father's affection, of my grandparents on the beach in Coney Island in 1917, right after they were married, of my great grandmother in Novoyarchev, right before the Nazis came. 602 was where I went to steady myself, to relearn who I was and exactly what I had become. When I moved out, when it became time for me to get back to my life, I took nothing with me, not the, cock, the Hockmesser or the Schlivovitz, the time-warped Bruegel or the juice glasses. I left with my cats and my clothes and my cookbooks still sealed in their moving boxes from the day I arrived and tucked the stash of my father's wartime letters into my knapsack. On my way out, I stopped into the kitchen and picked up my grandmother's old Sedeca box, which I had been using as a paperweight against the breezes coming in off Coney Island. Beneath it was the sheaf of wrinkled, handwritten kitchen notes that I had scrawled, some on the backs of envelopes while standing in the stores on Avenue U with the stern-faced Italian ladies. I stuffed the notes into my bag and left the Tzedekah box where I'd found it when I moved in, like a sentinel. The old refrigerator heaved a death rattle when I reached behind the damp, cool coils and pulled the plug out of the wall. I turned the lights off, stepped out into the hallway, and closed the door behind me. I reached up and touched the mezuzah attached by my grandfather 60 years earlier and said goodbye. I will stop there. Thank you. Um, you know, it's a, it's a funny thing when you write a book as a, as a modern, non-observant Jewish person um, and you talk about um, effectively stepping back in time, you know. I, it was like opening a time capsule, and I stepped back in time. And I've had conversations with people who, who wanted to know, didn't I want to honor the ghosts of, who, who were in that apartment? And my answer, of course, was I absolutely did but I also had to find a way to nurture myself. Um, and, uh, and I learned how to, how to do that, with, certainly with the help of the lovely ladies over on Avenue U, but um, for whatever reason, it didn't seem right for me to open up my own very modern cookware and use it. And I would like to think that wherever she was, you know, looking down at me, um, that my grandmother would have enjoyed the fact, uh, kosher or not, that I used uh, her cookware in order to take care of myself for the 18 months that I lived in, in, her, in her apartment. Um, so writing tray for me um, was a way to crack open the past, um, almost like a, like a piggy bank. And, um, and revisit the lives of those people who were so dear to me, who came before me, who I often in many, in many cases did not know that well. Um, but um, it, was, uh, it was an extraordinary experience to write it and I feel very honored that I had the opportunity, that I was given the opportunity to write it. So um, I think that what, with, with, um, with your okay, um, can we open it up for, for some questions? Yes. 
20 some odd years later, are you sorry you didn't take it? Um, the question is, 20 years later, am I sorry I didn't take anything? Um, it's funny, a lot of people ask me that question. And, you know, there was the silver, I didn't take the silver. And there was the china, and I didn't take the china. My cousins have the silver, my cousins have the china. To me, the most precious thing um, that I was able to take uh, were the collection of letters from, that my father um, wrote as a teenager, teenage officer, um, that he sent home to his parents. My father and I were very, very, very close. He was a wonderful man, but like any, um, any parent and child, we had our ups and downs and our ins and outs. And learning, I, you know, I, I was introduced to my father, the teenager, um, in those letters, and to me, they they're worth their weight in they're worth their weight in gold, and they they overtake everything else that everything else that was there. I I would have liked to have taken my grandfather's twelve volume leather bound you know Shakespeare in Yiddish, um, but that's actually up at Evo now, and uh, and my cousins donated donated it to Evo, so um, so that's where it's living now. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Ah, oh, that's the other question that everybody wants to know. It's like the real estate thing, you know. What happened to the apartment? Um, I moved out, um, and um, the apartment went co-op um, about, I would say, about uh, six months later. Um, and it is still a co-op. It's still co-op, and the building is still there. And I don't know if you all have this in Connecticut, but we, in New York City, we have this thing called StreetEasy.com. And it's a, it's a real estate, it's an online real estate tool. And you can find apartments to buy, to rent, um, in any permutation. But one of the other things that you can do is you can type in the address and apartment number of any apartment building in, this, in any apartment building in the city and it will give you the, the real estate, most recent real estate transactions and interior photography. <laughs> so of course, I was like, what does it look like? And um, let's just say there's a lot of granite involved, but the, you know, <laughs> the bones, but no, no, you know, no amount of granite will overtake the, the schmaltz in the pores. I'm sh I am sure. And the funny thing is, the funny thing is, is that, um, you know, if you walk into any of these older apartment buildings in Brooklyn, um, in, a, in certain parts of Brooklyn, and you open the door, and my cousin was looking for an apartment years ago, and he said, every time I, I go to the, you know, the agent shows me something, it smells like grandma's house, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's still, it's still there, but it's, it's a, uh, I think, sold for $175,000 most recently, but it's still there. Yes? How did, how did Lipschitz feel about the microwave? You know, that's, it's, a, that's a really, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny thing. I mean, he didn't, uh, he had no response. I mean, my grandparents, I grew up um, in, you know, in the 60s and 70s, I would go and have, uh, and have um, lunch on Sundays with my grandparents, and they had one of these, they don't even know that they make them anymore, but one of these massive, stove, um, uh, tabletop um, rotisseries. Mm -hmm. I don't even, like I said, I don't think that they make them anymore. Um, and if that didn't blow up the whole building, <laughs> um, you know, but I just, I, you know, we, we boiled some, we put some, we heated some water up and it blew, uh, it blew the fuses in the apartment. But, but my father knew where the, where the fuse panel was, so. It did not fall to Lipschitz, no, 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 it did not, thank goodness, yeah, yeah, yes? The level of detail, detail that you're describing all these seeds, were they things, did this come to you just to be down, did you require that you, did you spend time and did you come back to you, did that very much? Yes and yes, um, um, I, did you all hear the question? 
um, the question was about the um, the um, the, de the level of detail with which I write, and um, did I did I have to take a lot of time to uh, for those to come back to me, and was it an ex a particularly emotional experience? And the answer was that yeah, yes, it did take quite a lot of time, but um, we we are all we're a family of storytellers. Um, and for whatever reason, I, I also um, have something called a, sy a sy let's see, a synesthetic memory. Um, do you all know what synesthetic memory is? Um, it's actually a neurological condition, um, and I think uh, it's coming to the fore now that more people more people have it. Um, but those of us who have it never really talk about it. Um, because we think that everybody else has it too. Um, it's the, I'm going to try and explain it in the, in the simplest um, and the clearest way. It's the um, sort of conflating of one sense experience with, with another. So synesthetes will actually um, describe smelling colors um, and feeling music. And so, the whole book is actually has a lot of that level of detail in it. The, you know, the emotional is is always is always there. I mean, the experience of writing about uh, my own past, much of which, uh, some of which was not particularly um, fun, shall we say, um, uh, was was quite was quite difficult, especially having that additional level of synesthesia and I had in the, the beginning of the book takes place in Forest Hills in Queens and I grew up right across the street from a, um, a pizzeria um, and the pizzeria shared a wall with a shoemaker and you know that sort of like high-pitched squealing sound when you take shoes to a shoemaker I don't know what what it what the machine is but my whole life I grew up believing that pizza smelled first like shoe leather <laughs> and that shoes when you went into a shoemaker to pick your shoes up and you opened up the bag that you would get that you would get a whiff of garlic <laughs> um, and some of my old friends from my grade school from grade school and this is one of the good things about Facebook is that many of us are still in touch um, wrote to me and said, oh my god, I thought I was the only one. You know, I can't walk past a pizzeria without thinking that it smells like shoe leather. <laughs> um, so it's like it's that level of, of um, you know, that level uh, of, of syn synesthesia, which is, it's a quirky thing. It's not always a blessing, you know. Yes? Uh, you mentioned some words that I'm not familiar with. Uh, Shtetl? Shtetl. Gribbenes. Okay, shtetl and gribbenes. Two things that go very well together. Okay, so um, shtetl um, was um, an Eastern European um, tiny, tiny town, um, usually um, lim not limited to, but inhabited by religious, religious Jews. Um, they go back, shtetls go back uh, 900 years the history of shuttles go back 900 years, um, and there aren't. They do not exist anymore. They were wiped out uh, during the Holocaust. Um, and then Gribbenes. Gribbenes is, is uh, what we what we call Jewish crack. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's it's um, chickens chicken skin crispings fl cracklings fried together with onions, and I could eat my weight in them, you know, so. There were a few other words, but I mean, would they be translated in the book in French? Um, you know, probably not, and it's, it's there, there will definitely, when, when the book eventually comes out in paperback, and I have no idea when that's going to be, uh, it will have a, glo a, a glossary in the, in the back, um, because that's not the first time people have asked, and I would like everybody who reads it to understand what they're. Thank you. Sure, sure, thank you. Any other questions? How long did it take you to write the book? Um, about um, 16 months and a, and a lifetime. <laughs> How 
How did you ever get across Queens Boulevard? Um, underneath the subway. <laughs> so you know Queens Boulevard, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you ever shop on King's Highway? I not not once. Not, not <laughs> once did I go to did I go to King's Highway. No. I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, um, the question was um, one, one of the things um, that Kathleen en enjoyed was um, the fashion, um, which takes, which actually has a, a big, a large role in, in the book. Um, again, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. My mother was um, a, um, a model. Uh, my mother was a model as recently as 10 years ago. She was a fur model. She's now um, 81, just celebrated her 81st birthday. And um, she was, it was all fashion all the time in our house. So I grew up with, you know, the piles of, um, you know, Vogue and Bazaar in every room of the house. I could identify a Gucci from a Pucci by the time, you know, I was six. Um, and my father, um, also in his own way, was a very, very fashion forward. And um, because he uh, grew up, he was, he was um, 12 years older than my mom, and he grew up, he was an ad man. He was a, a, um, a Madison Avenue madman, ad man with the teak furniture and the three martini lunches. And he um, was a Brooks Brothers guy, you know. Um, he was a Brooks Brothers J Press guy, and so between the two of them, I I learned never to buckle the belt on my trench coat. <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> um, but but the the fashion was very much part of our culture and a very very much a part of our time, uh, time and place, and. Um, you know, of course, you know, I talked to my mother before I came here tonight and she said, you're going to wear black? Don't wear black. <laughs> so I was like, no, I'm not wearing black. <laughs> so, yes. No, no. She lives, um, she lives on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, about um, 10 blocks from Zabar's and about four blocks from Fairway and complains every moment of every day that there is no food in her neighborhood. <laughs> So, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. You can. You can. Um, my my author website is alyssaaltman.com. My blog, which I've been writing for um, about seven years, is poormansfeast.com. And I actually just. Uh, have a new post up right now on Poor Man's Feast that went up today. What is your first book about? Uh, my first book is Poor Man's Feast, which oh. is also up, up front. And it's, um, Poor Man's Feast is a story about, it's a very, it's a linear love story. It's a very Connecticut centric. And it's about um, moving to Connecticut in the year that I moved to Connecticut after I met my partner in 2000. Um, and learning, relearning how to cook because I went to cooking school. I worked at the original Dean and DeLuca in the uh, late um, 80s. And I grew up, well, I grew up also believing that food had to be very uh, tall and fancy for it to be good. And my, my partner, who is a wonderful cook and a wonderful baker, and grew up in a home with a mother who was also a wonderful cook and a wonderful baker, um, taught me. Um, that there's really nothing as good as a plain poached egg on a piece of toast, <laughs> and that's what you know. That's a, a snapshot of what the book's about. It's it's a, it's a story of transformation, um, and my first year uh, living in Connecticut. Okay, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.